Welcome, everybody. I'm Dr. Anthony Levinson, and today is Thursday, April 20th, 2023. This is our 37th iGerry Care live event. And the topic today is dementia friendly and enabling environments. We're really fortunate today to have uh, Dr. Anthea Innes with us. She's a social scientist who has specialized and worked in uh, dementia and dementia care for the past 25 years. Anthea is going to help us to better understand this concept of dementia-friendly environments, what it, what they are, what they look like in very practical terms, and what are some of the practical strategies you might be able to do to your homes, for example, to make them more uh, dementia-friendly so you can continue to allow your loved ones to live safely at home and optimize function. So we're going to, uh, as usual, do the first part of the session today, uh, where we'll have a quick discussion with uh, uh, Anthea, and then afterwards we'll uh, take any of the questions that come in. You can submit your questions through the the chat bot on the iGerry Care events page um, during the the talk today too. There'll um, there'll be some resources that Dr. Innes has uh, suggested, and we'll be providing those on the. Uh, event page as well. So uh, don't worry about accessing those. The recording will also be made available on the site. And there's also a survey on that page. So we look forward to your feedback. So uh, without further ado, uh, welcome, Anthea. It's great to have you here today. Thank you very much for having me. So um, maybe just to start off, tell us a little bit about uh, your background and, and some of the work that you've done uh, as a social scientist focusing uh, on dementia throughout your career. Sure. So when I was doing my master's degree, which was in applied social research, I realized that I hadn't done very much work directly with older adults. And so I got a job as an activities coordinator in long-term care settings. And that was really my first um lengthy exposure, I guess, to people with dementia, other than my grand who had a Parkinson's-related dementia. And when she had a fall and ended up in a geriatric unit, where when I visited her, there was lots of very strange behaviours going on, people reliving the war years, diving under tables, thinking there was bombs dropping on them. So that had been my kind of first exposure to dementia. And then the, the second one was really in the when I was doing my master's. And I was really intrigued right from the get-go with people living with dementia, why everyone else found them really difficult. They would often have these negative labels attached to them. And I just found it really fascinating to try and understand what was going on for people, how to include them in things, how to, yeah, I guess, enhance their lives in some ways. But again, I had quite a privileged position in terms of my role was to provide activities mm. and do a lot of the fun stuff rather than providing the, the direct uh, hands-on personal care. So I, I was able to do things that uh, people in their other roles might not be able to do. So my master's dissertation had looked at um, who, whose care staff found difficult um, in terms of how they were labelled. And then my PhD went on to looking at changing the culture of dementia care uh, in three different settings in the UK. One was in a, quite a rural setting, one was in a very urban city, and the other one was kind of in between. And so that, was, so that was really me doing dementia research, really from when I first first set out in the field. Uh, and I've kept going. And I, I guess my research has spanned right from pre-diagnosis right the way through to end of life care. And I've focused on technology. I've looked at uh, rurality as an issue in terms of people's experiences in rural areas. Um, I've had a lot of fun with the projects that I've been involved in, some quite creative projects, uh, creative music groups for people living with dementia. I'm not the musician, but we've worked with symphony orchestras to do uh, some fun music groups. And one of the kind of enduring uh, parts of my work is really to try and understand more from the perspective of the person living with dementia and also the perspective of care partners. And by that, I mean uh, friends and family members and also the perspectives of those who are who are paid to provide support and care, and those could be professionals or they could be uh, so-called unqualified staff who actually think are highly qualified in terms of the, the skills that they have to, to put into play when they're providing care to people living with dementia. So yeah, I've been I've been doing this for quite a while now, moved to Canada last January, and just starting off a new program of dementia research here at McMaster. 
amongst um, their age related research projects. Pretty, pretty fascinating range of topics and experiences and um, a lot, a lot of I'm interested, you know, it's it's been a year that you've been in Canada and some of what you touched on like early on in your experiences relates to some of the stigma that you witnessed in, um, you know, people being labeled as difficult and different attitude issues from from staff. Have have you as part of your work in Canada, have you noticed any uh, differences, you know, either internationally or within the Canadian context, or uh, do some of uh, some of these themes seem to emerge, you know, I think around the world? I think stigma persists wherever you happen to be. I think there's been lots of efforts to raise awareness of dementia, uh, the whole Dementia Friends movement right across the, the world, and it's also been played out in Hamilton. There's been a really lovely project, the Faces of Dementia. Some people might have seen the bus stops where there's um, faces, literally the faces of people with dementia on the bus stops. And that's been part of a, a Dementia Friendly Hamilton group. I was on the stewardship group. The project had already started when I got here, but I've been working with that really amazing group of people for kind of the last year. Um, so I think there's efforts everywhere to try and raise awareness and to try and combat stigma and negative perceptions, but I think unfortunately they still exist. So although I can see that there's been a lot of development in the time that I've been working in the dementia field, there's still, I think, an awful lot more that we can do. Unfortunately, it's the pace of progress isn't quite as rapid as we might like. I mean, it, Canada, I think, was the 33rd country in the world to develop a dementia strategy. So you could say in some ways that was kind of slower than some other, mm -hmm. especially Western countries. Uh, but I think Canada also learned from what had worked elsewhere and adapted it to the Canadian context. So I think in some ways, the what could have been perceived as the slowness of developing a strategy has actually enabled that strategy to uh, potentially have a more successful implementation in the longer term because... I think the, the 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 people who were involved in developing that strategy were really careful to try and work out what had been successful elsewhere and what would work in Canada. Yeah, that's that's um, yeah. Sometimes that's very helpful to be able to learn <laughs> learn from the other initiatives. Well, that's a good segue because you alluded to some of the uh, local and international initiatives around uh, dementia friendly environments to dementia friendly communities and why don't we just start off with uh kind of a, some definitions and and a yep. bit of a an overview of you know what exactly is meant when people talk about dementia friendly environments okay so the whole notion of dementia friendly has emerged from this dementia friendly community movement and broadly a dementia friendly community is a place where people living with dementia are understood, they're respected, and they're supported. So that sounds quite easy <laughs> in, in, in principle. It sounds quite a, a, a core principle um, and one that we can embrace. Um, it's an environment where people living with dementia are more confident in their abilities, where they can contribute to community life, where they're included in conversations, people listen to them, people speak to them, and that they have a choice um, in terms of the decision-making and control over their day-to-day -day lives. So that's the, that's the kind of broad concept of um, a dementia-friendly community. And related to that is this human rights lens that's also been applied to people with dementia, where people with dementia have the right to live well in their community. Um, so they shouldn't necessarily be excluded just because they have dementia. Uh, and this is really important because more and more people are being diagnosed with dementia, but most of those people still continue to live in the community. So some of their symptoms, might be not immediately apparent to the observer or they might be put down to just people having a bad day or just some mm -hmm. strange eccentric behaviors but most people living with dementia still live at home whereas when someone does end up in long-term care the, the chances are about 80 percent of residents in a long-term care facility will have dementia but at least 60 to 80 percent of people living with dementia still live at home and i think that's why it's really important to think how we can make um, public environments accessible to people with dementia and be dementia friendly. And that's both from the point of view of the built environment and also from the kind of social environments that people are, feel comfortable and confident to participate in um, social everyday life. It does 
sort of touch on a few of the the themes that we even mentioned in the introduction, um, in some ways, the the issue around being more inclusive and not stigmatizing, or you know, from a social standpoint, trying to respect the person with dementia's personhood and create these social spaces that are understanding and in, inclusive. Is that? sort of a, a fair summary of on the on the social side, I guess. Uh, I guess personhood is more psychosocial. I was lucky enough that um, I worked at Bradford Dementia Group with Tom Kitwood to kind of operationalize the term personhood with people living with dementia. So that's informed my work from a very early point. So I worked there and I supervised my PhD for a year until he died. And so the concept of personhood has been kind of critical and, and central to, to what to all of my work, really, how can we uphold the, the well-being of um, individuals living with dementia and their status as social citizens, really? Um, but I would say that personhood is much more kind of psychosocial concept. And again, I am I come at this from a social from a social science point of view. But I also think anyone who's doing dementia has to understand the perspectives of other disciplines and professions who are involved. And that actually is really helpful too, because when you're thinking about understanding what a dementia friendly society or community or any kind of environment might be, you need to look at the perspectives of multiple people and think about how you can find a common language and really work out what that means in practice for people. And talking to people living with dementia is a key component of that, but it's only really been maybe in the last 10 years that people living with dementia have had a more central voice, thanks to many of the really inspirational advocates um, who have dementia themselves and who are advocating on behalf of other people living with dementia. So if you were to maybe describe a couple of, um, you know, very specific examples of, you know, what might some examples be of dementia friendly community interactions, I guess, uh, or um, are, are this is, this is from a social standpoint, are there particular things that, you know, retail stores should be doing or sure. uh, government and community services should be doing? I'm just thinking about one, some of the one specific. Of, one of the key things about dementia-friendly communities is they do look at um, places that people might go every day in their life and they might stop going once they have dementia. And that could be because their families perceive that there's some kind of embarrassment or that the person with dementia is not welcome. It could be because there aren't accessible washrooms, that there's nowhere to get a drink, there's nowhere to kind of rest and sit. You know, there's no kind of public seating if people are, are getting tired, or there's nowhere to remove themselves from somewhere where there's an overstimulation that, that might cause some kind of agitation and uh, distress for the person with dementia. So some of our built environments are not necessarily very good for anyone who, who, who might be um, distressed by overstimulation or if you're just feeling tired or you're finding it hard to find your way around so I like to give the example of when I arrived at McMaster and my very first day I parked in the car park and I was told where I was meant to meet someone to get the keys from my office and I got out of the car and there was a sign telling me with lots of buildings names of buildings very small print very high up and I couldn't work out which building I was meant to go to. And I actually asked three people who were walking past, and this was in the pandemic, so it was fairly quiet, but three different people were around. And I asked them, and not one per, and they all worked there in some capacity, <laughs> and not one person could actually follow the signs that to figure out where, where, we where to, to direct tell me where to get. <laughs> so I think that's a key thing. You need to be able to find your way around. And if I think any experiences that any of us have where we can't find where we're going, you immediately start to get a bit of stress before you're even there. You might be starting to feel that you're running late, that people are going to think, well, where are you? You also feel a bit stupid because you can't work out you know, the directions of where to go. So an awful lot of um, public buildings, hospitals are a classic example. You go in and it's really hard to work out where you should be. And some of the signs are really conflicting. You might follow signs for so long and then they disappear and you don't know, you know, you lose track of where you're actually meant to go. And there isn't always people around to ask. And when you can ask people, sometimes they're really not very um, patient or kind or um, helpful. And it could be because they just don't know, or it could just be that they're in a rush and so they don't take the time. And people living with dementia, we know need more time. 
So I think there's things that all buildings, any building that we might be accessing as a member of the public, whether it's a library, a museum, a hospital, a restaurant, a department store, a grocery store, the signage and wayfinding is really, really important so that people can literally access the space and work out where they want to go. There's also things like if you go, go to the grocery store, um, and one of the things that struck me when I got to Canada as well, because I was finding it difficult, was how you how you identified which coin would go into the the grocery cart to get your yeah. your shopping. I call it a trolley. Uh, yeah. You call them carts. And I was also struck by how many older people were really struggling, and they would ask other people for help, mm. and people either completely blanked them and ignored them, or just said, "Oh, I don't know either." Even though they don't already, they, got, even though they had a yeah. cart and had yeah. uh, and yeah. had figured it out, and yeah. so I was really quite because that was in a in a in a grocery store where there was a lot of older people shopping, and so I was really quite struck by just simple things like even being able to select the right coin and have the dexterity to be able to put in and get the cart. Obviously, there's other places you don't need to do that to get the shopping you know, to get your cart to be able to do your shopping, but there's some really simple things that can be very difficult for anyone new to a system or a place to navigate. But if you've got dementia, I think some of those experiences help you have insight into what it might be like for the person with dementia. And if we can get those kind of things right that other people can understand, um, then the chances are we'll get it right for people with dementia. Or if we work at getting it right for people with dementia, we'll find everyone else can also navigate their way around space is much better so there are there are those basic things about even just accessing the space and then also the people who work in those spaces or who also are occupying those spaces and how they react when somebody has a challenge or they're asking a question and so that's when I think everyone in society has a role to play in terms of how we just maybe take a moment longer to explain something to someone or just show a little bit more patience or compassion for people and that's not always easy to do because people have their own lives, their own challenges and their um, their own speed of working. And that isn't always necessarily in parallel with what the person with dementia is experiencing. So there, there's a, you know, we're, we're talking today about, you know, dementia friendly environments and enabling environments. There's a bit of overlap, it sounds like, between uh, age friendly environments or age friendly cities and in part because many people with dementia are also older adults and then it sounds like there's you know there has been some movement and legislation towards um Im improving uh, and providing services for people with disabilities so things like in ontario the uh, aoda but across canada there's basically certain legislation to ensure that people have uh, various training and organizations and institutions are, you know, trained to improve the provision of services for people who may be living with disabilities. And so there's some overlap, it sounds like, between some of those, you know, movements or or the designs that might work for there's, everybody. Yeah. There's overlap and there's also lessons to be learned from some of that because age friendly cities, there's that's been um, an initiative that's been going on for much longer than dementia friendly communities. So one of the tasks I often set my students to do is to assess spaces in terms of how age friendly they are, if they're doing that like an aging course and how dementia friendly they are. If it's a dementia friendly course using different guidelines and those are things that I know that you're making available on the website in terms of some of the guides that maybe hmm. one can actually go in and try and assess how dementia friendly a particular place is based on tried and tested uh, tools and often with consultation with people with dementia too so how they found things when they go in so I think we can learn from some of those other things and there's also a big move to consider dementia as a disability so if you consider dementia as a disability too, then also that means that those who are responsible for making spaces accessible under the legislation also need to consider some of the cognitive difficulties that go alongside someone who has dementia. But my experience so far has been that Canada's, some of its supposedly enabling features aren't so enabling. If I just think about crossing a road and you have to press a button 
And if you were blind, you often, there's not like a loud noise that tells you, there's a tiny little beep. If you're at an intersection, you don't, how do you distinguish between the beep that tells you that you can cross that way or mm. or the other way? And also even like parking, parking is so, it's difficult in any country really to get an accessible parking badge. But even when you have it, once you get out of that, your car in an accessible parking space, if there's no signage, if there's nobody around, if the ground's uneven around where that parking space is, if you're in a wheelchair or have any other kind of walking aid, some of those supposedly enabling features actually aren't quite enabling in practice. And I think often people do the basics and actually don't really think about the detail around that, which would truly make some of these initiatives more accessible for everyone who is already um, has you know, been um, labelled as disabled or, you know, has been assessed as being disabled. As as somebody who, you know, works with patients with uh, neurological disorders, I can definitely uh, concur with your statement about that. A lot of uh, patients find, even in, in hospital environments where you'd think, oh, there's all kinds of people with physical, musculoskeletal, neurologic difficulties that will be attending the hospital. The uh, lots of room for improvement uh, yeah. with respect to enabling design. So I'm I'm and wondering actually, of, if you, sorry. sorry, go ahead. And some of that is because buildings are older, but equally some of it's even when things are refurbished, the the, the kind of cutting edge knowledge about what is you know constitutes kind of dementia friendly or age friendly or disabled friendly design isn't always put into place because it's either there's a lack of knowledge or people, even when there is knowledge, sometimes people implement it in strange ways. So one of the things we know, for example, about toilets for people living with dementia is if you have a different coloured seat to the main bowl, that, that can help, help encourage people to still be able to use the toilet. And if you have a, a flush that's readily identifiable as a flush and not something that's a bit um, new, you know, kind of a new kind of, new in vogue way of having a having a flush or even in a to wash your hands and I always think about the example in a an airport where you've got these you can have taps that also provide you with the soap and they also provide you with the hand dryer at the same time mm. so how do you work out even how to wash your hands so some of the the design features that we put into place in some places are actually disabling because they're confusing and mm. yeah, you I think most of us have probably experienced trying to wash our hands in one of these one of these kind of taps faucets where the, the hot air comes out the soap comes out and it's it can be very very confusing so if you had to maybe summarize a couple of you mentioned there's a few key guidelines out there that uh, we'll we'll share some of those resources on the on the event page on iGeriCare but what what are some of the like key components of those guidelines that you know if you if you are trying to you know figure out is this a well-designed environment or okay. or not so enabling designs generally around how you would use the space how you arrange the space and the specifications within the space so that might be the bathrooms and kitchens and the kind of sensors and handles and kind of low-grade technology that might be there and accessibility would be much more about access to the space um, and whether the, the easy example is a ramp, which enables people who are in a wheelchair or, or somebody's pushing um, a child in a, in a buggy or a wagon or whatever, is if it's depending on the gradient, it's going to be much harder to push. Um, so and usability is really, really key because can you actually reach a switch to turn it on and off yourself? Um, and I've seen some really lovely brand new buildings that have been designed for people living with dementia. And again, it, some of the doors are so, so heavy that an older person mm. or somebody who's just uh, frail, they're not able to even open the door. So it looks nice, but yeah. the, you know, it's just way too heavy. So the it might look a nice feature and you can see it's a door and you can, you can identify and handle, but it's just literally too heavy. Or you have some lovely accessible features like um, doors that open onto an outdoor space, which is really good to bring kind of to ensure the person with dementia can access indoor and outdoor space. But people will place things in front of those doors, which make it inaccessible, or the doors are kept locked, or um, 
which can actually be more frustrating then because then people are actually yeah. trying to get out. But if you visually block even access to the outdoor space for people who are sitting, just by placing things in the wrong place, some of these really nice design features where the light comes in and maybe encourages people to go outside, they, they don't work in practice. So enabling design will not compensate for the kind of how people use it, but the principles are very good. There's also principles around inclusive design and in Canada, there's a there's a nice website that actually talks about inclusive design. And inclusive design is really placing the person who's going to be using that space at the heart of the design process. Um, inclusive design is really trying to acknowledge diversity and difference between the types of people who might use the space, trying to offer choice. And a nice example of that is different seating. So we can have different types of seats that might enable people to um, get up and down more easily if there's arms or if there's seats on wheels and uh, those kind of things. So we need different kinds of seats to sort to kind of suit different kind of mobility issues and flex, you know, having spaces that can be flexible in use, having buildings that are convenient and enjoyable. So often people with dementia can be moved into long term care facilities that are on the outskirts of communities, which then means that some of the, the really good enabling environments that are within a community are actually very difficult to access because people and this is like where the some of the the more subtle forms of discrimination might come into place that people with dementia are physically removed from the hearts of communities um, and some of the more recent care homes actually try to be built in spaces that do have access to maybe a park a cafe a, a local shop, even a bus stop, so that people can still get out and about or even retirement facilities. Um, the World Health Organization has a whole lot of really useful information about age-friendly cities. And the World Alzheimer Report of 2020 uh, produced a whole lot of information around the physical and the built environment for people with dementia. So there's a lot of resources out there. And uh, they will be available on the website so that yeah. people can follow up some of those. There's also audit tools if you actually really wanted to look at your care facility or even your own home to try and work out some of the, the key design features. The two that I've used most are, one is a Stir University of Stirling tool called the Design Audit Tool, and the other one is an Australian tool called the Environmental Audit Tool. And they both look at simple, suppose quite simple things like how high is the handle, how high is the signage, um, the color contrast, um, any glare, any patterns that might um, make people quite disorientated or um, they can imagine that insects are coming out of the carpet because of the kind of right. um, pattern. So there's a lot of really good tools out there that people can use if they want to get into things in a bit more detail. But if, equally... If, sorry, I, I was just going to say, if if, um, if you were uh, uh, like looking at it from the perspective of a dementia care partner, family, friend... What are some of the things that you might suggest people look at in their own homes that, that they can the, maybe adapt? Could we share the slide mm. that I am? Um... Sure, let me, uh, let me put that up. Because this might be quite a good way to visually illustrate some of the features. Okay. So these are architect's drawings of where I worked in the UK before moving to Canada. So, and we did build a space based on these designs. So, Anthony, since I don't have anyone in the audience to ask about, <laughs> if you could look at that kitchen, the kitchenette area in the bottom, the bottom half of the picture. I, I can tell it's an architect's rendering because I lived in the UK for a few years and there was no fresh fruit there. So this is <laughs> this is clearly a, a design. No, I'm kidding. Um, so the what would top... be accessible in terms of um enabling someone to use that kitchen what 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 immediately springs to mind um it's quite it's quite a small area isn't it the the corner we're looking at the corner the corner kitchen at the bottom is that yes. right um you know there's a a vibrant color there's a the cabinets are quite high for the the dishes and there's only like soup bowls or teacups there which i suppose is consistent with uh british cuisine the um, <laughs> the well the microwave is like at a good height you know a lot of times people will but it is quite recess deep in in the corner if you were in a wheelchair you would definitely have difficulty reaching those upper cabinets 
Um, the, in terms the, of someone with dementia, let me give you a hint. Um, on the on the doors, you were able to actually see that there were what crockery is in the. So the you can see what's in the the glass enables yeah. you to see in. Is same with the what looks like the the smaller refrigeration. You can see what's uh, in the refrigeration side and in the uh, drawers. So in the drawers, yeah. So this is quite a simple thing that people can do. You might not be able to afford to redo your whole kitchen, but if there are certain areas that you want someone to still be able to visually recognize what's in those drawers. So by the time they've tried to rake through multiple cupboards, multiple drawers, they forgot what they're even looking for and what they're, they're maybe intending to do. So we had lots of people living with dementia who would come into this dementia hub who could actually still make a cup of tea for themselves in this dementia hub who could no longer make a cup of tea for themselves in their own home. And that was purely because you could see the milk in the fridge, you could see yeah. the, the spoons and the tea bags, the, we always had the kind of tea caddy on the, the work surface. You could in the drawer, you could see the spoons and you could see the cups in the in the upper cabinets. So people were still able to perform really simple tasks purely because they could see things. Yeah. And I would say like it's often the opposite, isn't it? Like it's much more characteristic to have. Uh, no labels or see-through on drawers even kettles might be like in a an appliance garage to try to remove it from the visual space um so microwaves are either too high or too low often. Yep. the other thing here you might be able to notice is that the cupboards under the sink um have kind of blended in so that's another thing when you're trying to avoid people going into a you know into an area that you don't want them to use you can help to blend that in so very few people would go to the pure white doors right because they they did just blend in whereas people would automatically go to the the drawers that they could see and you you already mentioned the bright color we would we also had a word and a picture of a kitchen item on the the signage to help someone find that when they came in this space so this space that we we were we we refurbished used to be an exam room, so it wasn't the most dementia friendly of buildings at all. Yeah, low no ceilings. So the other thing that we did there was to introduce maximum light sources. So there was two natural light sources, one at either end of the room. We had kind of four times the normal amount of light bulbs that you might normally have, so that there's a lot of visual light and it was day um, daylight light bulbs. And we also had lighting on the walls and freestanding lights. Now, that might seem a really basic thing to do, but anyone with an aging eye will have more difficulty in terms of seeing things. If you also kind of combine that with some of the challenges with dementia, having a light, bright space that's really visually accessible will enable people to find their way around and to use things in the way that you might want them to use them. So those are very simple things that you could still you could do at, in your own home is make sure you've maximized all the light sources and that you consider even just changing the, the doors on on some units if you want people to be able to see things. And I and guess even if, some... even if you didn't have the the money or the resources to put in more glass drawers or cabinets you could add labels yeah, sticky, uh, notes. <laughs> sticky notes or labels to lots of uh, people with dementia do that themselves when they're trying to find ways to enable themselves to remain independent they will literally have sticky notes all over their kitchens because uh, that's one of the, the areas that people want to remain independent they still want to be able to, mm -hmm. to cook for themselves they still want to be able to make a drink they still want to be able to kind of wash up after themselves so the kitchen is a really crucial area to kind of think well what what can be done in kind of low-tech ways to change um the use of the space and and i guess uh if you don't have the funds to kind of redo your lighting sources to add more built-in lighting having more like standalone lights, free or, lights. Or, uh, changing, free just, you can just changing your light bulbs to daylight bulbs okay which are much more much brighter yeah. Um, because even on the most miserable day, and you've mentioned a few things about the UK, we can get some really dull grey days. We don't have as many big blue sky days as as mm -hmm. Canada seems to have, even when it's cold. We get lots of grey weather. That that building always looked really light and bright, and people would comment on how welcoming it was. And partly that was because it was such a light, bright space. 
Um, is there something about this? The color palette is obviously quite, uh, you know, bright colors. The contrast with the orange and and like the pink and the green or the turquoise. What is there anything about the the color, color palette itself that was also felt to be, you know, enabling or inclusive? We consulted with our uh, members, older adults living with dementia, and current and former care partners. To, for them to decide which colors that they would that they liked so we did have a consultation process but the key thing is color contrast so because we had this one big open plan space actually it wasn't such a big space we wanted to differentiate different areas and so the use of color enabled us to do that really well so having the orange color for the kitchen was really effective having the the kind of turquoise on the on the kind of more work area mm -hmm. um, the image there you can't see that there would have been like a reception area when you came in as well and then there's some kind of screens there because this was still a working space and so we had these flexible screens that could be moved around so that you could kind of close off the workspace or open it up um, more effectively but we still wanted to distinguish it as a separate area this, these are still the architect's rendering. So in the end, we had kind of bookcase areas on the, the wall that's got the kind of shocking pink. And that and it ended up not being pink, it was a purple. And on the bookcases that we wanted people to be able to go and pick up things, um, uh, activities that people might want to do, showcasing some of the, the things that we made in the hub with older adults, whether that was painting stones, whether it was making bird baths. We had a, a woman with dementia who used to like to make cement bird baths and who taught the rest of the group how to do that. So we were able to showcase things on these shelves, add the bright colour, and it was really intended for people to go over to that and touch. You know, it was intended mm. to kind of be a visual draw to people, and that also really worked. The other thing you might notice is the flooring. This is actually considered dementia-friendly flooring because it's got no glare and it's non-slip. And yeah. flooring is really important when it comes to um, people living with dementia. If there's any kind of really big pattern or even little specks in a carpet or in a tile, people can think that there's insects there. They can think all sorts. Of, they can think that things are coming out of the out the floor to meet them. If there's glare, people might think there's that something has been spilt and it's wet, so they don't want to kind of walk on that area. And that's quite common coming in and out of shops, for example, um, or stores. And so anything, and obviously we need to have non-slip from having wet feet going in, you know, from going outside yeah. to inside. But often we, and you'll see these kind of shiny rubber mats and people with dementia can be really reluctant to step on those. So can children, actually. Young kids yeah. can also think the same yeah. thing. Um, they don't want to step on it because it looks like it could be slippy. And so making sure you can still have non-slip and um, kind of water absorbent mats as you go into a house or into a into a shop that, that that doesn't have that glare that looks like it's a big wet puddle so um there was an interesting question that that just came in and uh, the question was phrased should should doors be painted white or a different color and what if the kitchen wall is light blue in color so i guess that we're getting into some you know, fairly specific. specific types of questions but i don't know if you have any, so light any thoughts blue wall. about them a light blue wall immediately doesn't throw any kind of red flags at me, okay. but I guess it would depend on what else is within that, that kind of space. In relation to painting door, doors white, there's no issue with painting a door white as long as you've got a handle that's clearly contrasting with that door so that people can still work the handle. And there's also no issue if the walls around it are also are not white. If you have everything that's completely white, then people might find it very difficult to work out that that's the yeah. door and they need to go through it. So it's about the contrast. The of contrast, yeah. More rather than, than being a correct or an incorrect colour. Okay. Was there anything else that you wanted to comment on with respect to, to the slide? No, that's a few few points I've raised yeah. there. Um, any other uh, you know, co thoughts, comments, things to look at? in the home if you're a family friend care partner you've given us some thoughts around color and contrast of, of being able to potentially visualize uh, different th uh, tools and appliances in the kitchen to kind of facilitate the like foster independence and functionality uh, you've given us some input on flooring uh, as well Any anything else related to some of the other 
like rooms in the house, uh, bedrooms, front doors, things like sure. that? So one of the things that people often want to be able to continue to do, the person living with dementia and their family members, is for the person to still be able to leave the, the home independently, whether that's just to go into their backyard or whether it's to have a little walk in the neighbourhood. And one of the things that's really effective is just having notes at the door reminding the person, have they got their keys? Have they got their phone? Have they have they dressed appropriately for the weather? Um, just simple things that would enable the person to be able to go out um, safely. Uh, also things like the, the person might have some kind of tracking device in case they did get lost, some kind of safety device that there might be a panic button. So again, it has to be very easily designed. And there's some of these technologies that are you can buy off the shelf that don't need to be dementia specific. Mm -hmm. Those that are labeled dementia specific tend to be much more expensive than the generic devices. So it's important to actually think, are there some things that we could do to enable the person to go out more independently as in leaving the home? Uh, so that's leaving the house. But then when you're actually in the home, one of the issues that people often talk about is um, continence promotion, and especially at night. And one of the very simple fixes is to see if the bed can face the bathroom and if there can be some kind of light that's left on in the bathroom that enables the person to find that and or can a night light be used. So those are simple things that can help promote continence. There's other things that we can also do in um in bathrooms around the contrast so i already mentioned the contrast between the seat we also need to make sure there's a kind of contrast between the floor and either the pedestal of the toilet bowl and the sink so that people can see where things start and finish and mirrors um, some people with, living with dementia really don't like to see their image and they don't recognize themselves and they can get quite distressed so there's things that we can do we can buy mirrors that have kind of wooden doors or some kind of doors that close the mirror so it then just looks like a bathroom cabinet but you know it's it's got doors on it with no mirror but if the other person in the house wants the mirror they can have it um and i've also seen you can get them in ikea really cheaply uh, mm. or or online little kind of paper blinds that you can attach the top of the mirror and then drop down so that you uh -huh. can disguise the mirror really easily and it kind of then looks like a window just because it's got a blind on it. So there's simple things that you can do if people get distressed when they see themselves in a mirror. The other thing in bedrooms are some wardrobe doors, you might be able to see through the door a little bit. It might have a perspex door, or again, it could have a mirror, or sometimes there's a glass um, a glass door, um, and which might you might think actually would help because then people can see what's in the wardrobe. But it can also make people think that there's someone in the wardrobe right. and there's people hiding there. So again, there's simple things that you can do to kind of work it. Depending on the issue, you can disguise and um, adapt those kind of um, situations, depending on what might be distressing somebody or not. Of, of the uh, various resources that you've recommended that will be on the page, are there any that go into this kind of very... Uh, practical specific detail or they tend to be higher level like general guidelines the the guides i've flagged so far are kind of higher level um guidelines but there are even some nice video resources um there's a nice one from canada from a canadian alzheimer society um resource center and things that they've tried to do within their center that could okay. be applied also within people's own homes, which kind of help people find their way around. They have an they actually have the little blind on the mirrors. Um, so there there are there are resources there. Um, there's also things that people do with stairs to make sure that the person can still see that there is a stair by having some kind of distinguishing feature on the on the the initial tread of the stair, which is also used for people with visual visual yeah. issues too. So there's. There's things that we can do from other health related issues that we can also then apply that would work with people with dementia too. And I always say it's not rocket science. It's just trying to think about from the perspective of the person living with dementia and how we can then adapt things to enable people to still live independently and, and not um, be, see, you know, be seeing things that aren't there because of the because of mirrors or glass or glare or patterns that are just overwhelming. Um, even curtains can have patterns on them that can make people um, quite distressed because they think there could be snakes on the, you know, what the pattern could be interpreted, for example, yeah. as snakes on, on the, the curtains. 
So it's, it's things like that, just trying to think, well, what are they seeing and how can we how can we try and look at it more from the person with dementia's point of view? Yeah, I think those are just some fantastic uh, suggestions, very practical. And of course, you know, every, every person's experience is going to be a bit uh, different, but I think some of what you've described are certainly consistent with what I've heard from patients and families, some of the concerns around mirrors or patterns on the floor that might uh, lead to an experience like a hallucination and be distressing sure. uh, for patients. And some dementias are more prone to that. So for example, patients with Lewy body dementia yes. may be more likely to experience reactions like that. So um, yeah, fantastic suggestions, excellent resources. I uh, really want to thank you so much for joining us today. Um, very insightful. I think there's some other areas of your expertise that uh, lend themselves very well to some future live event topics, because we we have not really talked much about uh, people in rural environments. And I think that's a, that's a really important and different uh, lived experience. But uh, this has been a great overview of dementia-friendly environments, of uh, inclusive design and enabling design. And I, I love some of the practical uh, suggestions that you offer that people could implement in their homes at uh, like low cost that I, th I think can be really helpful. So thank you so much for uh, joining us today, Dr. Ennis. Um, I want to uh, just acknowledge that IgeriCare was developed with support from the Canadian Centre for Aging and Brain Health Innovation, powered by Baycrest, the Jarris Centre at Hamilton Health Sciences, uh, McMaster University, the Hamilton Health Sciences Foundation, the Alzheimer's Society Foundation of Hamilton Halton, and our uh, team at the Division of E-Learning Innovation. Uh, as you know, uh, teamwork makes the dream work. Uh, donations also help. And uh, there is a donation button on the top right of our website. Uh, there is also the survey, which will be posted in the YouTube chat if you are watching on YouTube Live. And it's also going to be available uh, on the iGeriCare event page, along with some of the excellent resources that Dr. Uh, Innes recommended. So uh, that's all for today. We'll see you at our next live event. And again, thank you all. Thank you.